and probabilities, which we didn't cover, and also the biochemistry, which I didn't think anyone wanted to go through that last night. Um, life must have been created uh, supernaturally. That is really the, uh, the only model. The creation science model is the only model that's supported by the scientific evidence in the laws. Now, I just have to read this guy. Anybody recognize this guy? This is Richard Dawkins. Uh, he is one of the, he's at the forefront of what I call the uh, neo-atheistic, belligerent, evangelistic atheists. And uh, belligerent, uh, bar none. I mean, uh, they're, they're, these, this is a nasty crowd, actually. He says, most, though not all, of the informed speculation, speculation begins in what we, what has been called the primeval pre, pre soup, a weak broth of simple organic chemicals in the sea. Nobody knows how it happened, but somehow, without violating the laws of physics and chemistry, a molecule arose that just happened to have the property of self copying uh, of self copying a replicator this may seem like a big stroke of luck freakish or not this kind of luck does happen and it had to happen only once what's more as far as we know it may have happened on only one planet out of billion and billion planets in the universe remember i told you the other day someone confronted me uh, uh, on the origin of life uh, probabilities, and he came up and said, it only had to happen once. This is this kind of argument. And I asked him, well, how do you know it happened here? Because we're here. And that's why I gave him the answer. Well, I know God created us. How do you know? Because we're here. And he looks at me and says, that just doesn't make sense. Exactly. That's exactly what you just told me. Well, that's, uh, that's the logic going on here. Now, he says, uh, uh, he, he goes on, here, let me, let's see. The sort of lucky event, lucky event we are looking at could be so wildly improbable that the chances of its happening somewhere in the universe could be as low as a, one in a billion, billion, billion in any one year. If it did happen on only one planet anywhere in the universe, that planet has to be ours because we're here. I mean, I, for me, I'd have to see it to believe it, that someone would actually say something like that, and he wrote it in his book. So everybody could see what he thinks and how he, how he thinks. The current accepted evolutionist origin of life scenario are untenable and the solution to the problem will not be found by continuing to flagellate these conclusions. I like the word because it's bacterial flagella. And uh, they're flagellating these arguments and this is an evolutionist who, who wrote this. This was uh, Dawkins again. He wrote that. Now, another guy, H.P. Yockey, he, he has a way of admitting what uh, what rarely come, comes out. He says, the current accepted, the current accepted evolutionist origin of life scenarios are untenable to the solution of the problem. I'm sorry, that was H.P. Yockey. That was the last one. All right. In this case, here we've got another evolutionist who's saying, so far, none of the current theories have been substantiated or proven by experiment, and no consensus exists about which, if any, of these theories is correct. Solving the mystery may indeed take longer than the origin of life itself. So what we have here is just an admission of, hey, we don't have the evidence. Now, these are evolutionists. They're diehard evolutionists. They're not arguing against evolution. They're amazed it happened anyway, in spite of all the odds. All right. So that brings us to our speciation argument now. Origin of life, origin of, origin of universe, origin of life, origin of species. And what I like to do at this point is point out that the origin of species really builds on the first two. And here's why. 
It is because you have the laws of science on your side for the origin of uh, the universe and origin of life. There are no laws governing or that we can appeal to for speciation. So what does that tell you right there? It's something important for us to realize. That is a gray area in science. Now, with the laws on your side, it's irrefutable at that point. There's, there's no argument. You can't go up against and contradict the law. There's no law to contradict in speciation because there are no laws. Um, there are some mechanisms of change, but not laws. So when an evolutionist typically debates a creationist, and this is what I mentioned the other day, this is why they don't seem to come together head to head. They seem to be arguing skewed like this. Typically, a creationist will zero in on the strongest argument, and that's the origin of the universe arguments or origin of life. Where is the evolutionist going to start out? He's going to start out with species because he's got mutation and natural selection mechanisms, which is not laws of evolution. Those are mechanisms for change, which creationists don't have any problem with. But you see, what happens is they start with speciations and work backwards in their argument, and the creationists start out with the origin of the universe and the laws and work forward. And that's why when you're re hearing debates, typically they're doing this. And I brought up the other night uh, uh, a, a doctor uh, that was in a, a debate with me. We had an ongoing debate for two and a half years, and he had challenged me about uh, my origin of, of the universe, origin of life uh, arguments. And he was, de he was attacking my points in speciation. And I had to stop and I said, well, wait, Dr. Cherry. Now, I'm not talking about speciation. I'm talking about closed systems. We're talking about the origin of life, the second law of thermodynamics in that particular uh, debate. And we had a little exchange there, clarification, and he put the chalk down and said, I agree. Now, he had been, that, that was about two years into that debate. He had missed that point the entire time. In fact, he told me and he, he participated in seminars that I was conducting at the university. Anytime I talked about creation science, anytime I taught uh, small groups about creation science, he said, make sure I'm there. So I made sure he was there. He had been listening to all that for two years. What does that tell you? Yeah. Even when you say it, even when you're trying to communicate, they're not hearing it right away. This is a very important point in our evangelism. You've got to listen to who you're talking to. You need to hear what they're saying so you know what they're thinking. If you don't know what they're thinking, you're going to talk right past them. If you want to communicate, find out what they're thinking and listen carefully to where they're going wrong. Now, that requires something on your part. It requires that you're able to evaluate what that person's thinking and why they're thinking wrong. And then, how you're going to correct it. And, uh, yeah, and, and for Dr. Cherry, he did that twice. I got him on the origin of the, origin of, uh, the universe and origin of, on life, uh, origin of life. We had the laws on our side, and he said, I agree. Then I got sick, and uh, everything fell apart there. We never met again. And so uh, I always wondered, well, I wonder what would have happened if we had continued on. But that was in the Lord's hands. All right, now the first thing we have to do when we talk about species is we realize that we're building on, if there's a supernatural origin of the universe and a supernatural origin of life, then precedence establishes for us, and this is how science works, setting up the next hypothesis. If it's supernatural for a universe, supernatural for life, then it's rational and logical to imagine, to think, to propose that there's going to be a supernatural origin of species as well. Now, the reason why this is important, because one of the things the evolutionists attack creationists on is the creationists don't have a unified theory. They don't, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't have the beauty, as they call it, of evolution where it just all ties together and you got this chain of events and it's just such a grand, beautiful scheme. But we do. 
It's, an, it's a supernatural, supernatural beginning, a supernatural beginning, a supernatural beginning. And there's continuity, there's consistency. Scientists love consistency and building on what is known. But of course, I have to qualify that statement, don't I? Because here they are, they, they say, we got speciation and then they've got contradictions for the origin of life and contradiction to uh, the, the origin of the universe. Ah, so what is their solution to that? That's not evolution. Yeah, did you hear that one? You see, they're redefining evolution. And the way they teach it is, that does not involve the origin of the universe or the origin of life. That's how they're redefining it. So evolution is a fact. And even now, there's a push to make evolution, not a theory, a law of science. That's where we're headed. And so it's very important that we recognize what, uh, that, that's why I went through, what is a theory and how does that differ from a, from a law? It's not a law. All right, here's what we're looking at. We're looking at laboratory evidence, fossil evidence, and laws of prob probability. The first thing we have to do when we start talking about speciation is understand the terminology, the definition of the word species. Because the word species is not standardized in biology. It, it, it's called the species problem. The ornithologists don't use the same standard to classify different species of birds as the herpetologist who's classifying amphibian and reptiles. They use different standards. You got a bird down here, pops out a red feather out of its head in Texas, and the ornithology says, ornithologist says, a new species. You got uh, Rana Pippians, who's hopping as a frog all the way up from Florida to Maine, and he's establishing five different populations there between the two states, and you cannot cross uh, the Maine frogs with the Florida frogs. They're, they're, they can't reproduce. You can pass the genes between the intermediate populations, but not between the two ends, and they're the same species. Now, now wait, the, 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 the bird, <laughs> The bird, all he, all he did was change a, feather, a color in his, in his head changed, and he's a new species. Yeah, that's the species problem. And uh, when we're talking about species, we have to define it. There, uh, we're really talking about a category, and I'm going to develop, develop this idea a little more. But species is simply a category. It's a man-made defined category. Now, we do know that it comes in the Bible, but man has redefined all kinds of words, hasn't he? <laughs> and we have redefined the word species here. Naturalists have had a, uh, and, and I'm quoting some evolutionists here just to show you, this really is an acknowledged problem in, in biology. Naturalists have had a terrible time to reach a consensus on this point. This is referred to as the species problem. And how high does the species go? Are we talking about species uh, uh, distinction or do we include the genus? Do we include the family? Do we include the order? I mean, how, do, how high up is a kind? Uh, so creationists have, haven't been able to use the word species freely. So they've been using uh, other words. Uh, the, uh, they use the kind or they use the Hebrew word. Uh, but Sometimes they'll use the word type, uh, and you have typologies. The main thing is they're trying to define and group what it defines a kind of organism. So that's, that's a big job. If there's a, some of you are interested in biology, you might want to think about uh, helping out the creation science movement and get into defining the naming and the kind. What are the boundaries for a kind produces kind? That, there's a big need there, and there's not a whole lot of creation scientists, so this is a long, slow job. Now, when we talk about uh, the uh, categorizing, there's a lot of research being done to define the boundaries. Now, in this picture here, we've got, well, there's in the horizontal rows here, there seems to be relationship. Well, that's pretty obvious. Now, the evolutionists go look at this and say, well, they're all, we're all related vertically as well as horizontally. Now, 
Here's the significance of this, and if you capture this, this is going to help you a lot whenever you see the hierarchy set up. Notice here, we've got a number of uh, trucks and cars in the picture, and we've organized them. And you can see in the horizontal rows, they're more similar than in the vertical rows. And you say, oh, of course, I can see how that's organized. That makes sense. Now, because it makes sense and because we organize it, does that mean they're related? What does organization and categories mean? What does that reflect? It reflects the ability of the scientist to organize and to categorize. It has nothing to do with relationships. Now, this chart here, you don't have to read through it and understand it. I throw it up here just to let you know, this is why there's a species problem. <laughs> there's a lot of organisms in the world and they keep finding new ones that they've never seen before. Perhaps up to 50 million remain to be discovered. And so that's a big task. Now, when we start categorizing, you get into taxonomy and you have a whole variety of different types of animals. And the nice thing about categorizing is we can talk about the same organism all over the world. We can talk about Homo sapien here. And Homo sapien is the same organism as it, here as it is uh, over in China or down in Chile or wherever it might be, we're talking the same thing. There's a seven-step classification. And we can circumscribe or whittle down just by communicating these different classifications. We can whittle down from a big group of organisms down to, oh, just one kind, human being. So we can take a kingdom and we have kingdom animalia here. And notice at the bottom, I've got mono, protista, fungi, and plant, as well as animals. These are your five major kingdoms. And if we say, I'm talking about animals, we automatically eliminate the other four. We say, OK, I don't have to worry about the fungus or the, or the mono or the protista. And then if we talk about phylum uh, chordata, that is the animals with the backbone, now we just eliminated the squid and the starfish and uh, the the invertebrates that was, we re, would refer to them. And then specifically, the animals with backbones, we're talking about mammals. Okay, now we just eliminate out the rep, reptiles and amphibians and other things. Here we're talking about mammals. You see how that works when we're categorizing? Boy, this is really an important thing. I'm telling you, specia the species problem is a serious problem in biology because that means you cannot communicate and talk accurately. And so it is a problem that needs to get solved. Now we can drop down to order and we're getting down and we get to family uh, homidy and then we get into homo sapien and we can talk about a particular type of organism and cut through all the others. And that's why the naming process is so important. And this is the scientific name for all organisms, genus and species. That's how all, all organisms are being named. So organization charts show the similarities and the differences between organisms, and that's how they get classified and organized. We can do that with cars, too. We can, uh, we can show uh, a, well, that might look like a mess. I don't know if you can see the organization. Let me, let me show you how this works. There, you see how it's all related now? You see, what looked like a mess and didn't look related, and you have to sit there and study it, I drew lines. Oh, that helps you now. Powerful. That, that, that was artistic drawing that just made sense out of it. It wasn't evidence. It was a line drawn. Now, we've got a group of animals all over the world of all different sorts, and if you can't see the relationship, well, we get it helped. And there it is. Now, what you couldn't see in relationship, the artist helps you. And he fills the gaps of absence. He fills in the spaces where there's no links. He's making up for the missing links with lines. And you go, oh, of course, now, I, now it all makes sense. That's a powerful psychological tool. And it has nothing to do with evidence. 
It's all about the ability to draw a line and fill in the gaps that way. And then people don't think about the gaps. They don't think about the missing links because you can see the relationship, how obvious it is. And yet there are evolutionists who, who are recognizing the deficiencies or the, or, or the questions that should be asked, and they're saying, you know, it's time to start questioning our underlying assumptions. The underlying assumption of the phylogenetic tree, which is that, that tree with the lines, the underlying assumption is that we are showing relationship based on similarities rather than what it really is. We're showing relationship based on, not, not on, not, we're not showing relationship, we're just showing how things have, share attributes in common or they're different, shared or different type of attributes. But we're not, it's not showing the relationship. Where does the relationship come in here? The lines communicate relationship. And that's, uh, that's where the evolutionists are uh, showing a presumption or a, an assumption that's not true. Now, there is a problem with that type of organization, and that, that is uh, uh, made apparent here in this chart. If homologous features, homologous, that is, if a monkey has an arm and a man has an arm, the same sorts of features there, and you both got a, he a head, or some animals all have a tail, homologous features indicate a genetic relationship. Now, let me just clarify that. You see, in order to look similar, then it ought to be coming out of the same information code, right? So whatever makes five fingers on, on one hand over here, I ought to see that code over there on other organisms that have a hand and five fingers, right? That only makes sense, why? Because the DNA, the chromosomes, are the information code. They code for what I'm going to look like. So if I look similar to someone, uh, someone else, I should have similar DNA. That makes sense, right? The, uh, the same structures ought to have the same code. But wait, the evolutionary basis of homology is perhaps even more severely damaged by the discovery that apparently homologous structures that all look the same from one organism to another, they're coming off of different genes, a different code that's making things look the same. That doesn't make sense. How did that happen? You see, that's a, that's a reason to bring into question these things. What mechanism can, can it be that results in the production of the same patterns in spite of different genes? Hmm, that's a big question. All right, so let's move then into, can, is it possible for organisms to actually change? Well, yes it is. I mean, you just look at the dog. The dog is one species of organism that has tremendous uh, ability, flexibility and dynamics in it, built into its DNA. Not the humans can too, but not nearly like the dog. And you see all kinds of change. You can go from a little chihuahua, a teacup chihuahua up to a big Great Dane and everything in between, floppy ears and virtually no ears and all kinds of dogs. Now here's how this works. You got a gene, a genetic code, and it makes the physical features of what you look like. So you got a genotype you got for gene, you got phenotype for the physical features. Now if you change the genotype, you're going to change the phenotype. And that's why it's so remarkable that you could have features that look the same, and yet they're coming from two different types of genes and a different code. How do, how do you explain that? Well. There have been many explanations. Uh, Lamarckian genetics, how many have heard of Lamarck? Anybody seen that? Well, in Lamarckian genetics, uh, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck had thought that uh, if, you change the, if you change the phenotype, the next generation will inherit the changes of the phenotype, not the genotype. See, the genotype is the code. And back then, they were not aware of the genotype, so. He set up an experiment, he was cutting the tails off of mice. And he was breeding them, waiting for the next generation, the next generation to have shorter tails. And their tails wouldn't get shorter, no matter how much a tail he cut off. Well, it didn't work. But that was one explanation. Uh, they, 
They're, they're still trying to figure that out. All right, now let's get into mutation and, and natural selection, and we'll talk about this little, little creature, the fruit fly with the big name. In, when, when we're talking about mutation, we're talking about changing the DNA code. Mutations happen. They occur. So uh, you might have a gene mutation. You might have a chromosome mutation. A gene mu mutation, there's a variety of different types of mutations. You can have a mutation where maybe an adenine changes with a thymine. That's a mutation change. But the function of the enzyme or the protein is un <laughs> unchanged, so you don't even know the mutation took place. But on the other hand, you get to a chromosome, and there's several different types of chromosomal mutations. You get a chromosome mutation, and more than likely, that organism's gonna, that cell's going to die. Because if you get a, a, an extra set of chromosomes, or you add one chromosome, or you lose a whole chromosome, or you cut out a chromosome in half and put it on another chromosome, all kinds of things can happen. That's major mutation. But there are mutations that are... That, that survive. And that's what the evolutionists zero in on. Not all the, and, and I'm saying this because if you're reading creationist literature, typically the argument has been uh, most mutations are, are lethal. The cells are going to die. All right. How come that doesn't phase an evolutionist? Because they don't worry about the cells that died. They're interested in the cells that live. And the cells that live are carrying the mutations. You see, that is part of their argument. That's why we have, even creationists have to think through some of their arguments there so that we can be effective, <laughs> we can be relevant to where the evolutionist is. All right, so when change takes place in the DNA molecule, like in Drosophila melanogaster here, um, fruit flies have wings. But as I told you, uh, over 100 years, millions of, uh, of generations of flies produce under accelerated mutational events, bombarding them with radi radiation and causing all kinds of change and mutation in their DNA. They came up with all kinds of strange-looking fruit flies, but they were still fruit flies. Now, in this case, I like the picture of this one because uh, they could no longer call them flyers. They had to call them walkers. The flies became walks. Not the kind you cook with, but they had to. They just had to walk. They lost their wings because of mutation. And mutations are usually harmful, but there are mutations that continue on and get passed on to the next generation. And that's what the evolutionist is interested in. All right? So that's what we have to deal with. Otherwise, we're just building a straw man and tearing it down. Well, most, are, most, most mutations are lethal and the cells die and the organisms die. Ha! Well, that's a straw man argument, right? Boy, you really killed that straw man. But it didn't phase the evolutionists because they're interested in the mutations that are preserved, which brings us to natural selection. Mutation causes the changes. Natural selection preserves those changes. And so, in this case, with uh, Darwin's finches on Galapagos Islands it being used as a great example for the evolutionists, they say natural selection does not cause change or establish how much change can occur. That's absolutely correct. You see, when you talk to an evolutionist and they say evolution is a fact, and you say, give me the evidence, they're going to say mutation and natural selection. You need to be prepared for that. Mutation does cause change in the DNA molecule, and some mutations are preserved. That's correct. Natural selection does occur in that those changes can be selected for and preserved in a population. But here's what has to be discerned, and this is where the, the real point of debate takes place. This is, this is the crossroads that really determines in the speciation debate between creationists and evolutionists, the crossroads there is, is change limited or unlimited? The debate is not about change. The debate is about how much change. And that is something creationists need to get into their mind, into their conversation. It's not about change. 
Evolutionists need to get that in their thinking too, to think correctly. And I say that because if you're talking to someone about speciation and they are bringing up evidence for evolution, they are going to be thinking mutation and natural selection. That is their evidence. And those are facts. And yes, they are facts. But they're not facts for evolution. They're mechanisms for change. They do not determine how much change. They're simply mechanisms for change. Yes, mutation takes place. Yes, natural selection takes place. We see that in the Bible with Jacob and Laban. And Jacob's out there applying, well, not natural selection, but artificial selection. I mean, he had a hand in it where he's, he, he, he's, he's repopulating the herd with spotted goats or non-spotted goats, depends on what he wants. And he was just applying the principles of natural selection before, before Darwin came on the scene. He was already, how do you like that? The Bible was ahead of them already, already talking about it. So what we have here is uh, the real contest is horizontal change or vertical change. Limited change within a kind or unlimited change. That is the key to understanding the debate here and really framing it. Don't let people get you sidetracked. This is really what you want to zero in on because this is where you're going to make headway here. Evolution, evolution versus creationism is summed up right here in this picture. It's, it's uh, vertical versus horizontal or limited versus unlimited change within organisms. That's the debate question. All right, so we've got, we, we know what we're looking for here in our debate. That's the question. And now, what do you do when you have the question framed and you know what you need an answer to? You go look for the evidence. And the first place you look for, go to the laboratory. So we go to the laboratory and we're looking for evidence of unlimited change. And that's where, that brings us to the uh, Drosophila melanogaster, the, the little fruit fly there. And they have bombarded that fruit fly uh, with all kinds of radiation, create all different, as I said, all different manners of types of flies, red eyes and amber eyes and no eyes and uh, white eyes and all kinds of body parts and a lot of very, very interesting genetic mechanisms were discovered. Uh, even master switches were discovered because they had a fly, uh, they had some flies and they were producing double Instead of an insect having three, three body segments, they had some flies with four. But it wasn't just a part of a body segment, the whole thorax was developed. How could the whole entire thorax be duplicated? Because there was a, a master gene that controls the other genes to manufacture the entire thorax, that's why. And when they hit and mutated that particular gene, you had a double thorax fly. Now that was amazing. And, that contributed to insights of master switches or, or a hierarchy of genes that control other genes, and that was fascinating in itself. Now, <clears throat> we have the fruit fly, and here's some very important uh, uh, conclusions that were made. To be sure, uh, Dr. Schwartz says, to be sure, there was a certain logic in the belief that it was unnecessary to postulate any, a, another mechanism for evolutionary change when one already appeared to exist, talking about natural selection at this point and, and uh, mutation. This logic also seemed to benefit from the assertion that not only had no other mechanism been observed, but that no other mechanism had produced species. Nevertheless, it was and still is the case that the formation of a new species by any mechanism has never been observed. What are we doing? Where are we in our lecture? We set up the debate question. The debate question is how much change can occur? Is it limited or unlimited? So we go to the laboratory. We see this, we see this uh, animal that's been bombarded millions millions of generations of fruit flies 
in an accelerated mutational system. Still, no new, no new species. And then we have another quote by, by another uh, evolutionist, Kelly Kevin, and he says, despite a close watch, we have witnessed no new species emerge in the wild in recorded history. Also, most remarkably, we've, we've seen no new animal species emerge in domestic breeding. And we've seen a lot of change in dog breeding, but we've not seen any new species. That includes no new species of fruit flies in hundreds of millions of generations of fruit fly studies, where both soft and harsh pressures have been deliberately applied to the fly populations to induce speciation. In the wild, in breeding, now let me catch you up here. Yeah. In the wild, in breeding, in artificial life, we see the emergence of variation. But by the absence of greater change, we also see the limits. That's an evolutionist. The limits of variation appear to be narrowly bounded and often bounded within a species. What is the prediction of the creation science model? Limited speciation. Kind produces kind. And that is exactly what the laboratory evidence is demonstrating. That even after hundreds of millions of generations of flies, we see limited change. Now, they have an explanation for that. They're going to say, well, that's because you can't expect millions of years worth of changes to be represented in, in, a, in, a, in a hundred years of laboratory. But hey, this is an accelerated mutational event going on. But it's also an, it's an admission that they don't have the evidence. They're excusing the absence of evidence, and they're really unwittingly agreeing with the prediction made by the creation science model. So when we talk about natural selection, um, natural selection is, is um, even evolutionists are beginning, some are beginning to rethink that because it's the survival of the fittest type thing. And by the way, just to let you know, evolutionists don't talk that way anymore. That's an old obsolete way of thinking about uh, natural selection. It's not the survival of the fittest anymore. It used to be. It's the survival of the fit enough. That is, they're fit enough to pass their genes on to the next generation, then they can die. They don't have to be the fittest, they just have to be fit enough. And so that's, that's a little, that, that might help you there when you're talking to an evolutionist. And uh, this tautology, what is that word? That means circular reasoning. How do we know that the animals that live are fit enough? Because they exist. How do we, why do they exist? Because they were fit enough. And how do we know they were fit enough? Because they exist. And so it goes around and around and around, which means you can't take a tautological argument. You cannot take it in the laboratory and test it. And that's the problem with natural selection. You can't, it, 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 it's beyond the bounds. I mean, you can build circumstantial evidence, but you can't actually design an experiment and test that it's correct. So that presents itself a, uh, a particular problem. There's all kinds of interesting quotes uh, here, and I'll, I'll go down here to, um, well, let's cover this. If organisms don't naturally produce new species, then where did they all come from? Same question that we got, origin of the universe and origin of life. If it didn't happen naturally, it must have happened supernaturally. And of course, all the evidence points to that. We've got laboratory evidence supporting the creation science model, and it doesn't support Evolution, 100%, by the way, doesn't matter if it's, if it's field or laboratory or academic or industrial settings, the, there is n absolutely zero evidence that change is unlimited. 100% of laboratory evidence is it's limited change. That's important for you to know. There's a lot more to be said about that, but that, that's the main thing you'll need to know. The creation science model is supported by the evidence. I showed him the other night, Rene Del Becco, a Nobel Prize winner, and he said, uh, well, you can't expect 
us to produce, produce new species in the laboratory, an excuse. The claim that change is unlimited lacks laboratory evidence. Lack of time is an excuse for, the, for evidence, and here's why we don't see it. When you actually look at the probabilities of what would be required to pr produce a brand new species of organism, you're looking at 1,000 to the 1 millionth power. Now, that's just uh, astronomical. We can't even wrap our minds around that. I'll give you an idea of how impossible that is to imagine. Um, Brother Joshua, what uh, electron do you think I'm thinking about right now in the universe? Uh, no, no. <clears throat> in the entire universe, it's been calculated that there are only... 10 to the 80th power subatomic particles, not even atoms, subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons. 10 to the 80th. I say only. You say, that number is too small. No, that's how big that number is. So how big is that number? A thousand to a millionth power? I mean, that's, <laughs> there's no, that, that's beyond imagination. Just the, just thinking about how many subatomic particles that there are in the entire universe blows your mind. I mean, you can't imagine it. This is the probability of a new species popping into existence. That's been calculated by evolutionists. That evolutionists actually did occur can only be established by the fossil record. Oh, that brings us into the fossil record. This is very interesting. I want you to take note of what he's saying. And this is how evolutionists have thought. It's the fossil record... Uh, that, we don't have laboratory evidence. The only way we can demonstrate evolution is the fossil record. Hmm. Oh, there's that guy, Charles Darwin, and there's his full title of his book. Now, they don't want you to know the full title of his book. It's politically incorrect, but he's the hero, and so they're protecting him. But notice, the, on the origin of species by means of natural selection or preservation of favored races in the struggle for life of life he is the one responsible that's who hitler read and built that whole uh, holocaust and final solution in nazi germany that's what nazi germany was based on right there so because if it can happen naturally how much better than we can accelerate and control human evolution if we take control of it ourselves FDR was a part of that in the United States. The Onita colony was doing eugenics over here just like the Nazis were because it was Darwinian evolution. And that was the science of the day. And people who were caught up into Darwinian evolution recognized, man, why wait for evolution to happen? Let's, let's guide it and make it happen. Especially the human population will have superior humans. So... That was something that was uh, taking place in the 1940s, and uh, it, it's still going on to this day. It's taken on a different name and a different form. Now, here's what Darwin says, and this goes along with the previous quote. If my theory be true, numberless intermediate varieties linking closely together all the species of the same group must assuredly have existed and he predicted in the false record you see in the false record you'd see this smooth progression from simple to complex organisms and then we come to uh, Lagrasse and um, He says that evolution actually did occur can only be scientifically established by the discovery of fossilized remains. Okay. Do we have that in our mind? Because what I'm about to show you is remarkable. I was, right, I was flying on a plane up to a debate at a university. And in, in the flight magazine of all things, Dr. Ridley, Department of Zoology at Oxford University, had written an article. And he said, the gradual change of fossil species has never been a part of the evidence of evolution. What? Darwin showed that the record was useless. What? Well, 
What did Darwin say? Most assuredly, we're going to see this documented. Why would Ridley say that the fossil record is not important? Lagrasse and others, and Darwin said, the fossil, it comes right, when it com, what it comes right down to is the fossil record is everything. Why is Ridley saying it's nothing now? Because they don't have the evidence. That's why. Isn't that something? Now, this brings up uh, this guy, Dr. Gould, who wrote The Panda's Thumb. He's since passed away. He said, the extreme rarity of transitional forms, missing links, in the fossil record persists as the trade secret of paleontology. The evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks, like I drew out for you, have data only at the tips and nodes where the lines end. The rest is inference, however reasonable, not the evidence of fossils. All paleontologists know that the fossil record contains precious little in the way of intermediate forms. Transitions between major groups are characteristically abrupt. They don't exist. That's the trade secret. It doesn't filter down into our high school and elementary and college textbooks. Uh, you can study evolution in, in, uh, in college and not know that. When you look for links between major groups, they simply don't exist. The lines here are filling the gaps of missing links. Dr. Gould writes, the absence of fossil evidence for intermediary stages between major transitions or an organic design, indeed, our inability, even in our imagination, uh, to construct functional intermediates in many cases, he said, we can't even imagine what they might be, the missing links, has been a persistent and nagging problem for gradualistic accounts of evolution. Whenever we look at the living biota, discontinuities are overwhelmingly well, we can go on and on. The, the point here is they can't find the evidence, and that's why it's really not important. And uh, they've got problems. The fossil record is not demonstrating what they wanted it to. And um, here's why. You see, what they, what they assume, the underlying assumption, is because they can organize, therefore it's a relationship. If you, if you understand that, that's going to help you a lot. They assume because they can organize, there's for, therefore there's a relationship. You can just talk about cars. You can take a, a magazine, car magazine and uh, show you know, some, of, some of the chrono chronology of, of development of cars and trucks and show them, does that mean these are all related? No, it's just organization. It's, man, it's a man-made construct. And so... Here's what this comes down to. Now I'll start wrapping up here. There's a lot to talk about in speciation, but punctuate equilibrium is this. Because they don't have the gradualistic missing links in the fossil record, here's how they explain it. The reason why they, they can't find the evidence is because there was rapid change taking place in a short period of time and populations resist change. That's what they actually see in the field. When you study organisms in the lab or, or in the real world, they're resisting change. They don't want to change. And when they do change, they change very rapidly, which means it happens so quickly it, with so few organisms that weren't enough to be preserved in the fossil record. And so what do we see in the fossil record? We see fully formed, fully functional organisms. And as we demonstrate here, there's punctuate equilibrium, and that's what this is called. That you have rapid change, long periods of equilibrium of resistance to change, punctuated change, long periods of resistance to change, punctuated equilibrium. That's where that theory is coming from. So again, when you look for links between major groups, they're simply not there. Why? Because the evolutionists say, well, there weren't enough 
uh, that went through transitions to be trapped in the fossil record. You got less than 1% of all organisms that ever lived are going to be trapped. That, what, what is that? That is an excuse for the absence of evidence. Once again, the creationists have it. Uh, the creationists actually predicted this phenomenon, didn't they? So the evolutionists are using an, an excuse, but the creationists are saying it's do, the fossil record is exactly what we expected to find, fully formed, fully functional organisms scattered throughout the fossil record. That's exactly what we're seeing. And the punctuate equal, e equilibrium theory is actually unwittingly, on their part, agreeing with the very prediction the creation science model made. Once again, the creation science model has laboratory evidence. It's got the fossil record evidence. And now you don't even have to debate fossils. You can just point out, let's say you come to someone's door and they're talking, well, I know speciation happens and uh, evolution has taken place over millions of years. And what are you going to say? Punctuated equilibrium. What? <laughs> now, you just remember that because punctuate equilibrium is the excuse evolutionists use to excuse the missing links in the fossil record. And how many people know about that? Unless you study paleontology, most people are not familiar with that. But you are. And now you can inform and be persuasive that even the evolutionists are agreeing with the creation prediction that, your, that fossil record shows fully formed, fully functional organisms in the fossil record. Now, why do evolutionists insist on continuing? Well, once an evolutionist locks into his theory, this is an evolutionist speaking, by the way. I got a picture of him. Once an evolutionist locks into his theory, questions and doubts become intolerable. Evidence to the contrary is summarily rejected, and all evidence is forced to fit his theory. He becomes a non-scientist. That's exactly what we're seeing going on today in uh, the field of science. The creation model predicted fully formed, fully functional organisms. The fossil record supports the creation science model. The creation model is supported by empirical data. Origin of the universe, origin of life, and origin of species. Now, we're not going to talk about polonium halos and geology and history of the Earth, but you don't have to. That's history. We're talking about what? Origin. How did it get here? I had, a, I had one uh, professor challenge me and say, well, how old do you think the Earth is? I said, how old do you want it to be? So he came up with a number. I said, okay, now let's talk about how it got here. See, don't get distracted, red herrings, getting off track. You want to zero in on your strongest arguments to make your case. Otherwise, you're really wasting your time. And so you get into the origin of the universe. You've got laws on your side. Origin of the universe, you've got laws and probabilities on your side. Origin of species, you've got punctuated equilibrium and the laboratory evidence of Drosophila melanogaster on your side. You can't lose that debate, can you? Evidence. For the uh, universe, intelligent design, we talked about that Sunday night. First law of thermodynamics, second law of thermodynamics, just lays to rest the whole idea of, of uh, evolution. We got the origin of life. We've got, we talked about the law of biogenesis. We got probabilities, just to throw out a number. It was calculated in, uh, by, a, by Dr. Harowitz, uh, a uh, biochemist, he calculated that uh, with a cell with just 124 proteins, which is theoretically the simplest, if even possible, doesn't include any other molecules, he calculated it would be 1 in 10 to the 340th millionth power that that could even pop into existence. 340th millionth power? Why, there's only 10 to the 80th subatomic particles in the whole universe. In other words, we're not talking about probabilities. We're talking about the absurd impossibility. It's not going to happen. And then speciation, you got the laboratory evidence for speciation. It supports supernatural kind. The fossil record supports fully formed, fully functional organisms. And here's what we see. The creation science model is correct. And if it is correct, then the Bible's right. God did create. If the Bible is right, then there is an Adam and Eve. And if the Adam and Eve existed, then there is sin. 
And if there is sin, then there is judgment. If there is judgment, we do need a Savior, and that Savior is Jesus Christ. Creation evangelism. Do you know him? And that's where we want to bring everybody when we talk about creation or anything else that God talks about. We want to bring them to Jesus Christ. Amen?